Hey. <laughs> um, so I wanted to start off by telling you guys a story of my first protest. So in kindergarten, <laughs> I, I found myself one day laying in the middle of the floor during circle time. And my teacher, she came up to me and she was just like, Crawley, what are you doing laying in the middle of the ground? And I looked her straight in the eye and I said, protesting. <laughs> protesting because I firmly believed we needed more playtime. Um, so I guess to say, I, I guess I wanted to use that as an intro to tell you, to give you sort of who I am as a person, um, what I believe, AKA you're never too young to start. Um, you know, following up on what you care about. So, you know, as David, um, he touched up, um, what I wanted to talk about was what it felt like moving or transferring from a magnet school to a, the regular public school system and the challenges I faced and what I had to adjust to. So really this will be, you know, um, containing uh, the differences and, well, mostly differences that I noticed. Um, so, first of all, I wanted to tell you guys about how I grew up with my parents. So, both of my parents are active in the Latino community. They're both from Puerto Rico. And um, so, uh, my parents, my mother, she works as a cultural liaison at um, a trailer park. I forgot the name. <laughs> but, um, so she works there as a cultural liaison. She helped. And she also worked at six, District 622, which is where I am right now. She helped a Latino a mon monolingual families um, gain the resources they wouldn't uh, otherwise uh, have access to, whether it be language barriers or something else. Um, my father, he's worked multiple times with the Latino community. He worked um, with a fellowship against uh, alcohol and tobacco and how it affected community of communities of color and other things like that. So um, I guess you could say I was raised in an environment where my parents were consistently helping others who may um, be in need or may have less opportunities than we did. So um, that leads me to my next. I have a little notebook here, <laughs> just in case. So I guess that leads me to Oh, what I was gonna talk about next, which was, oh, oh goodness, sorry. <laughs> which was, you know, EMID. I was an EMID from first to seventh grade, which is the East Metro Integration District. And um, I went to Harambe Community, Community Cultures and Environmental Science School, and then I went to Crosswinds East Metro Arts and Science School. And um, what I wanted to say was really they were, I didn't notice it back then, but when I look back, it was really supportive environments. It was really relaxed. Like in Harambe, they took, we took, you know, something, uh, a rather mandatory community uh, cultures class where we read books made by authors of that background. Um, we learned about the, we learned about um, holidays. We, they taught us not to celebrate Columbus Day, and I was like in first grade when they told me that. It was awesome. <laughs> it, was, it was things like that. Um, we had actual culture festivals. You know, it wasn't just generic um, ideas and stereotypes of groups of people. It was actual um, staff members from that background who would help or who would, you know, get kids who were interested to learn dances, or they would bring food, tell stories. It was things like that. Um, so when I first transferred to John Glenn Middle School in eighth grade, um, I will tell you, it was actually a literal shock. It was a culture shock. It really was. And um, really, I'm not trying to demonize the public school system at all, but I felt like 
a lot of schools these days like to sell that they provide a safe environment for students, that there is, all the students are equal, that they get the same opportunities, the same resources are available to them. And I, but I always notice that when someone tries to bring change to the school, they're often met with silence or resistance, which I feel was, you know, hypocritical, really. Um, because Crosswinds was a school that proved that they were serious about, you know, equity. They were serious about, you know, they cared about their students. They wanted them to succeed, um, despite, you know, the color of their skin, their sexual or orientation. It never mattered. And I guess it was just a prime example that, yes, it's possible. Um, there's no reason for resistance, really. And um, so I guess some of the first things that I noticed was the, in, the intolerance to a lot of things. Like, for example, homosexual couples. In Crosswinds, a gay couple could hold hands and no one would, you know, even blink or bat an eye. They never looked twice. But when I came here, um, you heard slurs, uh, weird looks. You were basically um, othered if you even tried to be openly gay or if you associated with someone who was openly gay. It was just like, what the heck are you doing? It was, that's just an example of something that I noticed. Another one was, you're just a number in large public school systems. Um, a lot of teachers, um, they categorize you into two sections. You're either a good kid or you're a bad kid. You're a kid that's um, riled up, disrupting the classroom. They categorize categorize you by stereotypes. They see your behavior, whether you get on their nerves or not in class, and then that's who you are to, to them. Um, your background doesn't play a role whatsoever into your behavior. They don't care about that. They just care about the fact that they want to get through their lesson plan, which I feel like um, was really frustrating because it's just like you say you're here to help students succeed despite any circumstances, but here you are immediately kicking out a kid without even trying to see their background or what they're going through. So that was another thing that I noticed because, you know, Crosswinds openly celebrated the individual. They knew you by name. They knew what was going on at home. They knew, they, you could tell them things that you really can't tell a lot of teachers in the regular public school system. Um, another thing was one of the first things I noticed was physically seeing racial barriers, racial and ethnic barriers. That was something I immediately noticed. Like even now, I can tell you in North High School where each racial group will be at. I can tell you, I know it by heart. And I noticed it in John Glenn as a 13 year old and I'm noticing it now. And um, because of those racial barriers, that was the first time I had to reflect on who I was as a person, being multiracial, but you know, identifying as Afro-Latina. There were kids coming up to me and saying, what are you? Are you black? Because you don't look completely black. They're like, what, you're Puerto Rican? I thought Puerto Ricans were white. And it was, it was stuff like that that I experienced. And it was just you know, the first time that I had to think, what am I? I never had to think that before because no one really questioned it. It was just, hey, you're Karali, what's up? How's it going? Um, so that was another thing that was actually pretty frustrating, to me at least. I think it'd be frustrating to anyone. Um, so with that, um, back to the, there was another serious lack of understanding in cultures. Um, I used to be part of a class that ironically focused on the integrity and character of an individual. But I heard almost daily Islamophobic remarks. I heard that men can't wear pink because that was for pansies. Um, I heard that women need to stop, you know, getting angry when we hold the door for them or making a big deal out of compliments, et cetera. Um, it was basically everything that I was just like, whoa, whoa, okay, hold, hold on here. Um, you know, racial jokes, et cetera. Um, the fact that some kids on the first day they dropped out because it was stuff like that. The instructor was encouraging behavior like that. And I eventually had to drop out after being there for a year and a half because I, I was done, really. Um, 
so that was just another specific example of what happened. Um, being at, at this point, North High School, this was last year actually, <laughs> but um, so with that being said, um, I kind of realized that I can't sit around and you know not do anything. <laughs> like you can't just sit there and be frustrated and be like, oh well, this really sucks. Gonna continue my life and then be you know upset about it tomorrow. Um, so eventually, I decided that maybe it was time that I could do something, no matter how little it seemed. So with that, my mother encouraged me to join the Youth Leadership Council. And uh, through that, I met many people who influenced me, such as um, Miss Angelica, Mr. J, uh, Miss Carrie, and Mr. John. They were my advisors in the Youth Leadership Council. They were the ones that introduced me that um, the white frame was an actual thing, that there was privilege and that there were gonna be obstacles for me, and that there was a reason why people were asking me what I was when before they even asked for my name. Um, it was things like that. It was actually, it, I guess in a sense they opened my eyes because being in a magnet school that focused on equity, you didn't face a lot of the things that many other students of colors face in a regular public school. It wasn't perfect, but it was, you know, um, I guess a lot better than being than having to be a student of color or, or an underrepresented student at the public education system. So with that, I started taking part in racism panels, uh, racism, racism discussions. I went to the Youth Activist Summit twice now. It's actually really fun. <laughs> I like it. Um, I went to the Facing Race Awards um, and things like that. So, but not only that, but I joined SWAG because, um, you know, just the fact that an elementary school kid by, you know, fifth grade, that if they don't know how to read like their other classmates, there is a much higher chance of them dropping out of high school. And it's little things like that that I felt like I could take a part in. But um, eventually, the Youth Leadership Council um, encouraged me to join the Minnesota Youth Council where I met other wonderful people, such as Grayson and Bailey, Frank and Shakur. <laughs> and um, the Minnesota Youth Council was, is a group of students and adults that work in equal partnership to, you know, uh, work on youth issues that matter, whether it be through philanthropy, education, or policy. And really, the Minnesota Youth Council can be whatever you want it to be. Uh, it depends on what you personally want out of it, in a sense, and they'll help you get it. And um, through them, I gained multiple opportunities. They were the ones that first took me to Ed Talks, and you know, without the Minnesota Youth Council, I wouldn't be standing on the stage today. So thank you guys a lot for that. Um, so, with that, what am I doing other than, you know, being a member of the Minnesota Youth Council or the Youth Leadership Council? Um, I started STAND. As you said, it was a seriously long name. And, you know, the other girls that helped me create the group, they're like, what the heck, Karali? Why would you do that? But it still sounds cool. It's long, but it sounds cool. And then... Well, I started that because I felt like there's a lot of racial tension. Even being, you know, almost 50% students of color, there was just a lot of things that were unspoken, a lot of things that students of color and other um, unrepresented groups of students had to keep to themselves because, you know, it made the rest of, or the majority students uncomfortable. So I created the group to kind of, you know, bring that to light. What, but more in like, here, let me give you an example. Something that we have as a rule in our group is if you seek clarity and you don't understand something or you disagree with it, you state that in a question. Because if you use a statement, it comes off as an attack. It's stuff, it's little things like that that we wanted to do. You know, host more racism discussions because even though let me tell you, 622 has about nine elementary schools, three middle schools, and two high schools. We hosted a racism panel, and not even 30 people, 
staff members showed up. It's things like that that we want to advocate for. The fact that we had racism discussions and we only had two in a school year. But we can have random pep rallies because our football's doing well. Yeah. Um, it was stuff like that. Another thing I did is I took part of in the week of action, which was October 3rd to October 11th, which helped. Um, it was part of the Solutions Not Suspensions Coalition. You guys know? Um, we, they were having a walk-in, and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. But, you know, being in a suburban neighborhood, which is predominantly, you know, white, although we have 50% students of color, there was no walk-in going on. No one even knew what Solutions Not Suspensions was. And, you know, I was just like, oh my gosh, this is serious. Can you guys help me make one? So with help from Brandon Smith from uh, the Minnesota Public Education Equity Partnership, I hope I wrote that down right, <laughs> um, he helped me bring it together. I actually faced a surprising amount of resistance. Like, I was told some pretty rude things by administrators. Like, oh, you know, well, I can't technically, you know, make you not do it. He's like, for some odd reason, we have to give you your First Amendment. You think I'm joking, but it's just like, okay. And um, it was stuff like that. And it was like, oh, well, you know, I don't know if it's gonna rain or something on Monday, but you know, and I hope you know that half your flyers will end up on the floor. I did it anyway. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, and, Although we met a lot of opposition, we also got a lot of support. Like, honestly, a lot of African-American males that tend to be, you know, heavily affected by corporal punishment wanted to start a council for solutions, not suspensions at North High School. So that's currently something we're working on right now. <laughs> so, um, with that said, um, that's enough of what I do. What about what you could do, honestly? So something that... I made a little list for you guys. <laughs> Yay me, you're welcome. Um, the first thing is maybe start your own group. Make another group like Stand. Because you know, there's a lot of students that would like to address policies that they feel are unfair, but they don't know how to do it. They're by themselves. Why don't you, you know, get them all together? You know, we work, we work in numbers. We get stuff done in numbers. And you know, start a group, um, hold, hold racism panels like we were doing. Uh, little things like that, or just you know little meetings like we do where we have a vocab word of the day. So we'll define what is um, white privilege and we'll have a vocab word of the day. And it's little things like that that we do in the club, even if you don't you know, actively participate in holding you know, walk-ins or um, Izzy's intentional social interaction. Or if you're on the sh shyer side and you don't feel particularly, particularly comfortable with doing that, um, maybe just post, like putting up posters in your classroom or in your office, you know, of world leaders like Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, that works too. You know, um, pro-gay posters, letting kids know that this is a safe zone for them, that you support them, that you care about them, and you want you know, nothing but the best for them. It's just little things like that. Like, you don't have to be flamboyant about it. I know that's not for everyone. But you know, um, little things like that would help a lot. You know, um, encouraging coworkers to go to workshops that your district or office may be holding, or creating your own if there isn't any available, trying to get that done that would ultimately help because, you know, as someone who works in education, your priority should be learning more and understanding students who may come from a different background than you. So, you know, workshops are really helpful with that. And lastly, you know, just going to events like this and listening to people like me actually really, really helps, you know, because it shows that you care and it shows that you want to listen and it shows that you're ready to make a change. So with that, I thank you guys for listening to me speaking tonight, and I hope you have a good night.